Hello. Oh, okay. Here. Um, hi, I'm Tim Jang, and uh, this is Rob Reardon. Uh, we're going to get started just a few minutes early because we want to make sure there's time for people to ask questions. Um, so to make this as interactive and high yield for you as possible. 20 minutes is not a lot of time to talk about all the things that can go wrong when starting a TEE program. Uh, so we're going to try to go through these a lot pretty quick and then try to leave you time for questions afterwards. Um, so like, like I said, I'm Tim Jang. That's Rob Reardon. He's my hero. And uh, you should listen to him more than me. Uh, we have no financial disclosures, and we don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, as you guys know, you're probably here because you know that resuscitative TEE is a paradigm shift. Um, so CARDS does their TEE, and uh, the average time is about 90 minutes with an in procedure time of about 30 minutes. So when you talk to people about doing TEE, they often have that as their paradigm. Uh, and ironically, TEE was actually used in the 80s and the early 90s to start to figure out how does CPR work. But then, in the cardiology world, they stopped using TEE for CPR, and they then just started using it for advanced monitoring in the setting of like cardiac anesthesia and in the OR. And so, around our hospitals and stuff, everybody thinks of TEE as a high-level skill that's done by extra trained people. Uh, and so, like, even your average cardiologist doesn't do TEE, your average anesthesiologist doesn't do TEE. They all think of it as the extra trained cardiologist, the extra trained anesthesiologist, so they can't fathom that a dumb ER doctor would be able to do TEE. And yet, we all know that resuscitative TEE is different. So there's a number of things that you can run into in terms of credentialing. Um, first is turf. Who owns uh, TEE? And uh, you should figure out, before you start trying to do TEE, who actually owns TEE in your hospital? Uh, every hospital has its own hierarchy for who owns this before you it come on the scene. So in some places, it's owned by cardiology. In some places, it's actually owned uh, by the echo lab, not just by cardiology. Sometimes it's actually owned primarily by cardiac anesthesia. So you've got to figure out who the players are in your institution who own, uh, who, who kind of own this uh, area in your hospital. The other thing is you have to realize that there are competing guidelines, uh, like we see in other areas of ultrasound. So your American Society for Echocardiography, uh, the Society, uh, the Can Canadian guidelines, they all have slightly different requirements for how many exams you have to do. You just have to know that all of their guidelines basically say to do, to do basic TEE is about 50 or 100 exams. And so when you talk to people, you're going to have to keep in mind that th whoever owns this technology or thinks they own it has that in mind of what they think minimum training is. Um, the other thing is questions come up of whether or not you can do SIM versus hands-on training. So a lot of places find starting a program to be very difficult if everybody has to go into the OR to do a case during cardiac anesthesia because try to get 30 faculty members to do 50 cases, you basically are looking like a 10-year process, right? So that becomes prohibitive for some places. So you have to understand what people, how they think of training and how you want to design your training. Uh, obviously, like I said, uh, the question of is it going to be done in the echo lab or the OR? I've, different hospitals I know have had it done differently where they say, hey, we want you to do it in the TE lab. Some say you have to do it in the OR. Uh, and then there's also uh, questions of consent that sometimes get raised with uh, us doing it. Um, so one of the things I'll just say is I think we both are big believers that learning by simulator alone is adequate. So at Harbor uh, and at Hennepin, almost uh, we did like a pretty much 100% training just on simulator training. And we found that all of the people who we train are able to do it, and we have decent numbers. Um, you can see here, obviously, that uh, they're doing a mid-esophageal four-chamber view, and they're doing CPR in progress. And this is something that, like at, at our institution, none of the cardiologists had ever done. They never did intra-arrest TEE. So we're, you're doing something that a lot of these people who might own the technology don't actually do. And that's something you should think about. Yeah, I met with our cardiologist before we started, and they wanted to be in charge of us. And I asked them, have you ever done one, just one during cardiac arrest? They said no. And I'm like, well, you're not going to be in charge of us, because that's what we're going to do. So they just kind of like backed down right away, because they, reali they realized that that wasn't their thing. So. The, a good example is that video, uh, you see that that's kind of soft clot in the heart there. Um, I sh I've showed that to cardiologists. They're like, yeah, that person's probably been dead for a while. But if you do this a lot, you realize you see that in the heart a lot during cardiac arrest. It's no big deal. When they get ROSC, it goes away. So it's, it's not a big deal. They would have declared that person dead, right? So that you could show them things like that that they've never seen, and they're just kind of like, no thanks. We don't want anything to do with this. 
Um, so other things that come up is uh, Im questions of image storage. So again, like we're used to, um, depending where you're at, you're going to serve. Uh, di you're used to doing uh, still images, so obviously there's a higher requirement for image storage during CPR. And then if you're going to store images during a resuscitation that's 40 minutes, you have to th think about how you're thinking about image storage, because you know you're, if whether you're doing still images or four-second clips, trying to film a 40-minute resuscitation makes you think really differently about image storage. Um, the question also it comes down to who's doing QA. Like Rob said, um, a lot of institutions have this like, okay, we'll let you do it, but then cardiology has to like supervise you or cardiac anesthesia has to supervise you. So you have to think about who's going to do your QA. Um, the other thing in terms of billing, so a lot of places care about billing. There's a lot of confusion about uh, what it means to do a complete exam because uh, with TEE, there's not a limited. So for example, those of you who do POCUS, you know there's like a limited abdominal, a limited um, thoracic, limited things. There's no limited TEE um, modifier. Um, but there are different codes for the, po the probe placement. And then there's, uh, and then the complete procedure would include probe placement, image acquisition, and interpretation. So you have to just understand that there's different codes for those. And there's actually a separate uh, ICD-10 code for when, when you do it after TTE is suboptimal. So just ha trying to understand the lay of the land, because you have to deal with your administration and the people who do billing and coding and how this is going to impact everybody. These are all things you have to be able to navigate. I'm going to touch, touch on some of these, and then Rob's going to take over, because there's a ton more to talk about. Um, so one, one problem that we ran into is just how many probes you're going to have. So the probes tend to cost about 25000 a piece which is not a small amount. Um, the other thing is the probe warranty is uh, um, with almost every manufacturer is only a year, whereas with your other probes, you can usually get them warrantied for three to five years. And at least with the Sonosite probes, not only are they only for one year, you cannot extend the warranty. So you're gonna, when, as you think about starting a program, you have to think about the longevity of your probes, how you're gonna keep them under warranty, and then keep them refreshed so you can continue using them. Uh, the other thing is machine and probe uh, compatibility. So I just mentioned, like, if you have that like, for example, we have sonocytes, but we have three different generations of sonocytes. So depending on which probe you get, it will only work with certain machines. So as you think about trying to have enough probes and machines, you need to make sure that your, the probes you have will match the machines you have. And I know you think that that goes without saying, but I talked to somebody who they ordered the wrong probe for their machines, and so they just spent 75000 and had probes they couldn't use, which created a problem. For it, it derailed their whole TE program for a year. Um, so the other thing is storage, uh, storage cabinet and site. So Rob's going to talk about this. Infection control loves to harp on this stuff and how you store the probe. This literally took six months for us to, to solve because infection control for us had a concern about where the probe, uh, where the cabinet was going to sti stay, who had access to the probe. Oh, the, the, the cabinet's not long enough because of the, how high the um, probes would dangle from the ground. Even though product, product specs were okay, the uh, infection control people didn't like it. So you have to deal with those kinds of things. Transport equipment and uh, procedure and, and time. So the, if you look at your TEE probes, different manufacturers actually have specifications for how long the probe can sit in a container before it's processed. So for example, the original process we were going to have was that Central was going to process our probes, but it was going to potentially be a four hour turnaround time, which meant that the probe could sit for four hours. It turns out that the Sonosite product uh, for the probe says you can't le let it sit for four hours in that kind of con uh, container. So we have to rework that process because you think about how long can it sit in a container not processed and then how you're going to work that out for processing. Uh, the other thing with wipe and solution compatibility. So we had the problem that the solution that Sonosite recommended for processing their TE, for our TE probes, was not currently used by our central because when they processed the Philips probe, the Philips probe actually recommended a different solution. So if you don't encounter that ahead of time and kind of nail that down, that's going to derail you because central can't process your probes because they don't use the solution that you need. So that's another thing you need to think about. And the last thing is, like I said, infection prevention and control. They, they found everything to be concerned about that had nothing to do with patient care. Um, and it had to do with the size of the cabinet, how many probes can be in it, there's all kinds of things they ask, uh, like what kind of, um, who's going to transport it? Oh, can the tech transport it? Maybe it should be a doctor. Who's going to wipe it down? These are all little things that you have to think about in your protocol so that when you go to your institution, you have all those things taken care of because somebody's going to want to regulate it. And especially if you're not doing it, then they're going to have higher scrutiny. Make sense? All right, Rob's going to go, and then we can take questions at the end. Um, probe breakage has been our biggest problem. We 
since we've had 15 or more probes. Um, most of them are now broken. Um, we do a lot of exams. We've done over a thousand uh, like in the last four years. Um, so they do get used a lot. We use TE more than our cardiology department. That's how much we do this. Um, so probe breakage is kind of part of the deal. Um, but I would strongly encourage uh, emergency departments to take cleaning and all, all those pieces into their own hands rather than send them down to central supply. Talking at our place to our cardiology department, they say the same thing we do. Like we, the probe works, we send it down to central supply, it comes back broken. We don't know what's happening, but we've gone down to watch them, reprocess them. Uh, the people down there, everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, they let them sit around a lot in buckets of whatever solution. They don't really care too much about them. They don't really, they have no idea that they're so expensive. Um, and the cleaning stuff that you can, the cleaning system that you can get for an emergency department is about the same price as one of these probes. So if you're gonna get like three to five probes, for the cost of one probe, you can get uh, a, a machine that cleans them and that thing will you know, probably last you at least 10 years. So this is how, on the left, that's how we used to uh, cart our probes around in these little plastic boxes. Um, they tend to, when they lay like that, they tend to get twisted and they stay twisted. So after a probe's about six months to a year old, uh, you'll notice that it's, uh, the transducer used to be uh, aimed in one direction, now it's 90 degrees to that, just from laying in a twisted position. And the, the manufacturers recommend that you don't store them like this. Uh, Civco makes a, if you're just going to carry the probe, they make a special case, the one on the right, just to carry it in, uh, which is a little bit better than ours because it doesn't allow the, the parts to get too, uh, too curled up. Um, one thing that we wanted to talk about was a leak test because the most common reason uh, early on when we started our program, uh, Central Supply would just say, hey, you guys sent two ultrasound probes down, two, two TE transducers and they failed the leak test, so we're not gonna send them back up, they're broken. And we were like, what the hell is a leak test? Um, so the <laughs> leak test is that they're testing the probe, the outside cover of the probe to make sure the insulation is intact so they don't shock the patient. So you can see the probe is in, and it, this, it's ridiculously easy. They throw it in a bucket of water, basically. And they have a, a number two there, the conductivity probe is just like two electrodes that sit in the water. It electrifies the water and then they have this um, specialized meter that they put. It's connected to that, and it's also connected to the head of the probe, or the head of the transducer, and the, that little machine just says failed, uh, didn't fail. And so we, I went down and watched them, and I was like, I noticed that it's not snapping into that uh, the transducer adapter, and they're like, oh yeah, see your probes are made by Mindray, and this is made by Philips. I'm like, <laughs> they're not compatible, that's why. So all our probes were, <laughs> all our probes were failing the leak test because they were using the wrong adapter. And they're like, "Well, you guys would have to buy that adapter." I'm like, "Yeah, it was like it's like three thousand dollars, right? You're failing these thirty-five thousand dollar probes um, because you you don't know that you need a three thousand dollar adapter." So just by going down and watch, but we had to go down and watch them do it. Um, and I, after talking to the cardiology department, they're like, "Yeah, well, they have the Phillips adapter for ours, but they fail them all the time anyway. We just re reuse the probes." The next time it comes up from central supply, it didn't fail. And so we went down again, and I, I asked the guy, like, oh, it failed. Do it again. Well, it passed this time. Do it again. It failed. Do it again. It passed. So it's like flipping a coin. So, um, <laughs> so this is something you really have to have on your radar. Um, half the probes that come from central supply, they have a little, we just told him at one point, like, don't just send them back up, put a note in them that it failed and then we'll just deal with it. Because um, our cardiology department says we just, we just use them because they all say they failed the fail leak test. So, so I don't know what that means. That I don't know that anyone in our hospital has ever been shocked by an ultrasound probe, but something to think about. Um, Tim, you were saying the same thing happens at your place, right? The um, other thing I was gonna say is uh, having more than one leak tester is important because if they have a problem with the leak tester, you don't want your program to be derailed because there's not a backup. So at least ha make sure there's a second leak tester available. And it helps to get the, the ultrasound company involved because Mindray's been really good and they like, we'll go down and talk to these people and just go come back up and go, they don't know what they're doing. Um, so 
I'm like, well, that's a sense I got. I'm glad you agree. Um, we're looking at getting this system. Civ Civco makes a whole bunch of ultrasound uh, uh, care equipment. And this Astra thing just allows you to, it's kind of like the um, uh, Trovan. Yeah, we have a Trovan for our transvaginal probes, which has worked really nice. We used to have breakage with the transvaginal probes. We got the Trovan and haven't had any breakage since then. So I think the same thing is going to be true with the TE is once we get this thing, our own people will do this. They'll transport. They'll transport it directly over to this thing. Put it in. It's very easy to use. And then, and you can do the leak test right in here yourself. So you can control all that and know that everything's compatible and you're doing it correctly, um, rather than have some other people in some other area of the department who you don't know doing all this stuff for you. Uh, the other thing that Tim mentioned is cabinets. So like Civco will make. Uh, sells these cabinets, which are the ones on the, the one on the left, uh, to hang the probes because that's really how they should be stored. Um, we found that we, uh, that's a, that cabinet in the middle is ours. Um, I just went to Home Depot and bought those hooks, and now we leave them on those hooks. Um, and the, it's nice; the cabinet closes; it can hold five probes. It's right behind our resuscitation area, so really convenient. And this is the place where we used to store uh, bronchoscopes uh, back in the day when we had bronchoscopes that you reused instead of bronchoscopes that you throw out. So we don't need the cabinet for that anymore. And uh, it's kind of lucky, but if you don't have something like that, uh, you could buy a cabinet. Uh, we also are experimenting. We don't have much experience with it, but they make these uh, probe covers for the TE. Um, and it would make sense that they they might take a little bit less abuse if you have the covers over them. Um, so I don't, I don't know how much that's going to matter. We're actually storing them uh, with the cover over the top now just because uh, they're hanging in the cabinets um, bare otherwise. Um, one other problem that we found early on um, when we started uh, having all of our faculty, we have over 50 faculty that we've taught TE and they all do it regularly. Um, is they were really worried about pushing these probes down like they were going to do some serious damage to the patient. And we reminded them that, you know, those red rubber tubes that you shove down everyone's throat after you intubate them, um, it's about the same diameter, so don't be afraid. <laughs> you, uh, you can go ahead and push it down. You know, don't put a, a crazy amount of pressure on it. You know, if you can't, a jaw lift will really help if you have someone else do a jaw lift uh, while you're pushing it down and keep, just keep it in the midline. Um, and if there's resistance, just kind of redirect it. But most of the problems with putting the, uh, the, the probe down are just right up in the throat, of course. Um, but if the people that are putting these in have just intubated the patient in most cases. So another option is to, to use laryngoscopy to do this. Early on, I was using video laryngoscopy to place all the probes. But it's, just too, it's just a hassle. And I just started pushing the probe down. And most patients goes right down. Cardiology, or at least our echo lab, when they have trouble putting these down, uh, guess who they call? Anesthesia. <laughs> they don't call us yet, but they should. Um, they call anesthesia to use a laryngoscope because cardiologists don't know how to use a laryngoscope, so they, they have to call somebody else. We don't have to do that. Um, the, one, the other problem we run into is we taught four, uh, basically four images that we wanted our uh, faculty to be able to obtain and a lot of that was just for teaching purposes you know we want them to be a, we want them to know what they're looking at um, no matter what uh, view they're they're getting but we find in most cases that if they just get this single view a four chamber view you get all the information you need in a cardiac arrest you can see both the, the mitral valve the aortic valve the left ventricle the right ventricle you know this is pretty much all you need in a cardiac arrest so don't overcomplicate it if you see this view um, you know, you you'd probably stop, and that's the information you want, and then just you just park the probe and and let it and go ahead and watch the heart during the whole resuscitation. Um, the other thing is that the most common problem I see is people push the probe down too far, so they go right past this view, and then they're like right in the middle of the heart, and they're looking around, they can't figure out where they are. I bet about 90% of the time when someone says, "Hey, can you come over here and help us?" I just pull the probe back a little bit, and I get it. It, this view shows up. So. It's really, really common to go right past this view. Um, some people don't want to learn to do this because they're, they're worried about complications. M the great majority of the complications happen in the back of the throat, and they're counted as complications in studies looking for complications because they're like scrape on the back of the throat, you know, th there's a little blood on the probe. 
these are these are people uh, in elective cases where people are going and getting this done in an echo lab. We're not doing elective cases. If this, someone has a little scrape on their tonsil when I'm done with this, I don't care because they were in cardiac arrest. <laughs> so these aren't complications to us. The complications we care about are these. Uh, are we going to perforate the stomach or the esophagus? And these are all huge studies where they did a full array of views, which means they went down through the esophagus into the stomach, turned the probe 90 degrees to get an apical view. We don't do that. We go halfway down the esophagus and we stop and we hardly ever mess with the mechanical button, the mechanical levers. So it's really safe in these circumstances. Imagine how safe it is in our hands. So we just push the probe down, don't mess with the mechanical levers, steer, use the electronic steering to get all the views we want. And so it's hard, you know, the, the perforation rate should be very close to zero for what we're doing. Um, the other thing is um, <coughs> departments wonder like, okay, we are, our ultrasound faculty might do this, but our, our non-ultrasound faculty, the pr people that don't have a special interest in ultrasound, you know, they're not going to do this. But we found the actually the opposite. So the gray bars are, uh, or the black bars are ultrasound, uh, black bars are non-ultrasound faculty. The, the uh, lighter bars are ultrasound faculty. You see most of the exams in our department are done by the non-ultrasound people including the one uh, night uh, guy who uh, does more than anybody because he, he tries to outdo me in everything. Um, so, you know, we've pretty much proven that uh, it, it can be done by any emergency physician uh, with just like four hours of training on a simulator. You don't need to go practice this on real patients in the operating room. As a matter of fact, uh, that might uh, slow down your progression. The simulator is just fine. The simulator that we're using for this is made by CAE, and they make, they make military aircraft simulators. So the guys who are flying <laughs> military jets are learning to fly them in their simulator. So it's not surprising this, that they also make a simulator that you can learn TEE on. Okay, we can take questions now. It um, doesn't have to be stuff that we talked about. It can be anything that we can think of. We're still depending on Central now. We're just now um, putting into the budget for one of those things I showed you. Yep, yep, and we're going to do all that ourselves. Uh, the four views that we teach are the same one like Arntfield did, um, the four chamber, and then it, at, at, um, at zero degrees, uh, three or long axis at uh, like 140 degrees, and then uh, the short axis at zero degrees, and then the bicable view. The bicable view is by far the least helpful. So, <laughs> so unless you're doing some, you know, it's kind of cool if you're doing a central line and can watch the wire come down, or if you're doing a pacer or something crazy, like, like you might use it once in a while, but not very often. For ECMO placement, yeah. The one thing you have to be careful about in ECMO placement is um, I've, I have done it with a cardiologist there and we're trying to figure out where the tip of the ECMO ca cannula is and it can be hard if you're cutting through it obliquely. You think, oh, there's the tip and then you get an x-ray and it's like, you know, the tip's like way up there. Uh, you know, so you can make a mistake by, by just the cut through it. So you have to be a little careful. The one thing is helpful if you see the, if you actually see the end and you see blood sucking into the cannula. Uh, no, we bill for them. We just, you just can't. So the, the only reason, uh, well, I would recommend billing for them because you're spending so much money on this and they're, you know, we think they're clinically very useful. Um, the one problem you might run into is if cardiology might say, well, w you know, if you bill for it then, and we do one on the same day, then we won't get reimbursed. You just say, okay, on the off chance that you ever do one on the same day, which will never happen, then we'll drop our bill. And they'll just go, oh, they don't have an argument. Then. So I, I wouldn't worry about it. There is a bill for, I think there is a code for like a reassessment, um, which we wouldn't be doing if we're doing the first one. But um, it shouldn't really be a problem. This, these aren't the kind of exams you would do multiple in one day. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when we got credentialed, we said um, it's a, we're credentialed for cardiac arrest or near cardiac arrest. So near cardiac arrest is just about anything. So if you think the patient might have a cardiac arrest, yeah. go ahead and put for it. Us, we we agreed to not do it in non-intubated patients. Yeah, so for us, at our institution, once you're intubated, then, then you're allowed to do TE. Um, so, and we're also doing it in traumas. They're doing it in traumas too. So some places aren't doing it in traumas, but we've had, he has some good success and we've had a few good cases that are trauma, trauma patients who had the TE done. Yeah, we've had several patients that were the trauma surgeons actually requested that we put it in because we couldn't, they couldn't feel a pulse and we were looking with TTE and like telling them the heart's beating fine. This isn't a heart problem. And they're like, can you put the TE down just so we can get a better view so we all can all look at it. And like they, they can, the, the images are so clear and so obvious that even though they don't do, you know, ultrasound or cardiac ultrasound, they're like, yeah, okay, I get it. You know, the heart's definitely beating. So. We don't really have a rule. I mean, in, in our cases, it gets scooped up pretty quickly right after the case. Our healthcare assistants will grab it, put it back in that box, and like take it out, take it away. Yeah, I think what some departments do is they spray them down uh, with some sort of cleaning solution and wipe them off just so they're not, they don't have like dried blood on them or something. Um, but I don't know the rules around yeah, that. Yeah, our protocol is that once we do it, it once it, once we're done. We give it to, and it gets taken down to central. I don't know how long it sits in central, but that was because infection control was like, if you read, there's one line that says it's not supposed to sit, depending on what you have it sitting in, the probes aren't supposed to sit like in a bag for more than a certain amount. And like one of the, when Rob showed the little, um, the first box, one of the things infection control had for us was if you read the fine print, you're not supposed to keep a bend of more than like, it has, to, it can't be a bend less than 12 inches. And <laughs> so like literally infection control was like, you have to guarantee that when they put it in the thing, it doesn't have a bend that's tighter than 12 inches, things like that. And so you, you kind of have to at least address those concerns because if there's somebody who's reading the fine print, you're gonna want to at least know and have it addressed. So in, in your product description, it'll tell you how long the probe can sit in like a bag or in a, in a case before, it, before you have to do something with it. And you have to know how you're transporting it because if, if you curl it up and the, the bend is too long, it can void your warranty. Yeah, over there. We don't because people are in cardiac arrest and our, our ET tubes have a little bite block and it just goes right next to the ET tube. So that hasn't really been an issue. Yeah, so yeah, we, we, we have a, our, um, our tube holder has a bite block in it so we don't, we don't have to have a bite block. <laughs> we could probably we, hook you up with some people who yes I think we have the info I've we, I've provide I mean I, we've both provided that info to other people doing it it's probably just not formally like in a nice protocol but we've given that info away Oh, the moisture prevention in the cabinet. We don't have any. Um, he, w he was saying his vent. He, your, Ours, our our vent. cabinet is vented. Ours has vents in the bottom, but I don't think it's connected to anything. <laughs> um, you know, it's not wet in there, but... Um, No, the only, the, the uh, one ET tube was dislodged, um, but the person that 
was putting the probe in and had just intubated the patient and just like realized that he dislodged the ET tube uh, and just put it back in with video laryngoscopy, which he had just used a, a few minutes before. <laughs> and then we had one case where somebody went to use video laryngoscopy to put the TE probe in and realized that a, an ET tube that was placed by EMS was not in the trachea. It was, the balloon was blown, the tip of it was in the trachea, but the balloon was blown up above the cords. So that patient actually was saved by, <laughs> by TE. Um, <laughs> and uh, what else? Um, we had one case where it wouldn't go down and the trachea was transepted. That was not the fault of the, you know, that got, that got flagged as a complication, but it was like the person who had their neck on the steering wheel that transepted the trachea. <laughs> Um, <coughs> and we had one case where the uh, balloon on the endotracheal tube was leaked, popped, or whatever. I don't know. I, I still don't believe we did it, but it's associated with us because it was placed, and then after we put the TEE probe down, we, we found out that the balloon had, wasn't working. So it counts as a, one of our complications, but I still have no idea because it was not a hard placement. And so that was. Uh, yeah, I think endotracheal tube um, displacement would be the thing I would worry about the most. In the case of reason. You mean with learning a scope to make sure it's in the right place? You know, whenever somebody comes in that we didn't intubate, I always do that anyway. First thing I do. And I, you know, so I would make sure that, yeah, it's in. And then now let's put the probe in. But it's not a bad idea to check, you know. If there's any question after you pull it out, that you move the endotracheal tube, I think it's a good idea. Question in the back. We had different experiences with that. I'll say at Harbor, and what I, I always recommend is find an ally at your institution who sits at the MEC or whatever level so that when people ask, well, what the hell are they doing, that other person says, oh, they should definitely be doing that. And so at Harbor, the, my partner was the head of the SICU. And even though I don't think trauma is the best indication, because the head of the SICU was willing to say, hey, I think you guys should do this, we, really, we worked on starting a protocol just with surgery to just do it on trauma patients. And then once we trained everybody and had a protocol in place, I then got the other buy-in. And obviously, I mean, we've only done a few cases in trauma. We do it much more with resuscitation. So uh, finding a partner somewhere who will stand with you so you're not standing alone, I think is huge in getting through a lot of that red tape. And I think there's enough out there in the literature that you could learn on a simulator and just go get a probe and start doing it. Um, we, we just bought a probe and started, several of us started using it, and it was like three years before anybody noticed. Um, and then by that time, like I said, I've done it a lot. You know, like now you're gonna, you know. And then our department chair got involved and said, I, no, I think we should all be credentialed. He's gonna get credentialed, I wanna be credentialed, and we'll all get credentialed. And then, so the actual, the people that brought up the credentialing thing were like, oh, I wish I would have said anything. Now, the, now we have 50 of them. So I, I don't think there's any problem either way. I think if you want to go through, can, th there's just enough out there in the literature now to, to show that it's, it's a thing and you should be credentialed in it if you want to be. I've been told we got to go. Yeah, if there's any other questions, we'll go out in the hall and, Thanks. and answer them. <laughs>